Sister Myers, give her a hand tonight. Let her know you appreciate her teaching. Praise the Lord. She's doing a fantastic job. Those of you that love Sister Myers, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to pray for her. 
Uh, she starts her new job. We were sitting at the table. I was looking across at the greatest crown jewel we ever lived on, on this earth beside Jesus. And I uh, told her, I looked at her, I said, you look like a flower with all the petals on it. And uh, anyway, I said, I'm so proud of you. I said, uh, you're going to be working in Florida Hospital. She was trying not to smile. She really was, but she couldn't help it. And I'm proud of her. She's been through a whole lot, you know, to get where she's at. And so thankful. But pray for her. She starts her new job. And uh, she's got to stick people. She's got to find veins and draw people's blood. And we don't want her sticking anybody and not getting any blood. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> hallelujah. Anyhow, come on, Brother Stephen. Give Brother Stephen a hand. Let me appreciate him as well. Hallelujah. I definitely want to go through the motions at all. Amen, brother. You don't want to go Come through on. the motions. Yes. Don't want to build, spend my whole life building a kingdom in the sand for it to fall. Yeah. I'll be the first to tell you that American dream will fast and become your nightmare. Amen. I'll be the first to tell you that. So 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 10. So he arose and went into Zephathah, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go, and do as thou hast said. But make me there of a little cake first, and bring it unto me. And after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of mill shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day the Lord had sent it the rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of mill wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fell, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by life. Yes. Lift your hearts with your hand with me. Lord. Dear Lord God Almighty, I plead the blood of Jesus on this sermon tonight. I rebuke every opposition, every stronghold, every chain, every wall. God, let this message speak to somebody's heart. God, give us the ear to hear what you're saying. Give us an eye to see what you're saying. They see what you're doing in our heart. God, give us a heart to receive this message. Let it be a seed in our heart and a plant in our soul. Oh, God, let this message speak to us tonight. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. We're going to preach to you tonight something that God has burned into my spirit. Uh, in the last uh, few days, something God had laid in my heart some time back and uh, God revived this in my spirit and He had spoke to me on two words and sometimes when God begins to give you something it may kind of evolve into what He's leading you to and God spoke two words to me in the beginning and I didn't know where Brother Eric was taking me but I ended up hearing the Lord say to me a barrel and a bottle I remember those words. I heard that a while back. And uh, normally I will jot that down. And I didn't this time. I don't know why. But in the last day, last night, I believe it was, God began to press on my heart again. Again, I got this thought. A barrel and a bottle. I began to get on my face and pray, talk to God, just meditate on this. And before it was over with, the Lord led me and I'll preach tonight with God's help on a barrel, a bottle, and barely enough. We're thankful tonight, aren't you, that God has made a way in difficult times. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I know tonight that this is a very familiar story to most seasoned Christians. Say amen to that. Amen. Yeah. But I believe that it is worth our time to take just a few moments and take a closer look. And what took place in the Word of God, how it relates to you and me. Is there anybody besides me who can say, I thank God for the walls of Jericho. I thank God for the three Hebrew boys that made it through a fire. Thank God for Jonah the whale. But I want to know how this applies to me. How this relates to me even in this day. Does anyone else feel the same way? 
But you see, there came a day in the time of the lives of the people as we read about in Scripture that they had gone astray from God. They had allowed their rebellion to cause a wedge between them and God. And this is what the Word of God has told us. Our sin separates us from God. Is that not what the Bible said? But this separated them. And in Deuteronomy 11 and 16, this is the basis behind what God was showing them. What was that? He says, Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived. And turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and He shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, lest you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. So when we read in the book of Kings in chapter 17, we read how the people went through a time of trial. Some say around three to three and a half years approximately. The Word of God has revealed to us they went through this time of drought. This is the basis and the premise behind the Lord's reasoning. God had already warned His people. He had already told them that their disobedience would lead to a time in their life. That if they didn't follow the ways of God, listen for the voice of God, follow the commands of God, that there would come a time that the heavens would be shut up. We read in the Word of God and see how that Elijah was used by God to pronounce a type of curse over the land. That curse would be that God would shut up the heavens, that there would be no rain. But if you understand what took place in the Word of God, it was not just that the rain was withheld, but any time that there is a famine upon the land, it not only affects the fact that you don't have water to drink, but a famine can also usher in a time of, a drought can usher in a time of famine. The reason is, is because your cattle don't have the water to drink. Your animals don't have the sufficient water to drink. How many knows what happens when you don't have the water to drink? A lot of things begin to die. When you don't have the right water, plants begin to die. Animals that survive off the nourishment of the plants. When the plants die, the animals, they in order, they die. And so there was a type of famine as well in the land because of this drought that took place three and a half years. I've often thought back to the Word of God here. I believe it was Nebraska that I read about here a few years ago that went through a tremendous time of drought. There were thousands upon thousands of acres that farmers used to let cattle graze and, and they would grow and they would have great herds of cattle that they could take to the market. But I believe it was Nebraska that they said, you can look it up on Google, probably find out for yourself. But there was a tremendous time of drought. It was so bad that they were having to go to other states to buy their hay for their animals. They were having to reach out to other states for truck drivers to bring large quantities of water to their state. And I thought to myself, well, that is in our generation. We can, we can set up a freight line or we can set up a train or we can set up some means to bus in or truck the water in to where they need. But can you imagine living in a day where they don't have the means to bring large quantities of water pumped out of great reservoirs where Zephyr Hills or some other spring to bring to this place that they lived in. And so they were in a tremendous time of drought. Discouragement filled the land. There are people that are that are barely getting by. Elderly people die in times of famine and drought. Elderly people perish, get weak, their immune system gets broken down. People are in a time of discouragement because people began to sell off things just to be able to buy water. How many of you know that when something is scarce, the value goes way up? When we were going through Hurricane Caesar, you may remember there was a time that there were people that were having to go after people for price gouging because gasoline went way up because people were taking advantage of those that did not have the means. And, and so what was happening is similar to what you saw in the Word of God where a famine came into the land. You remember, and the Bible said that they were selling doves dung and donkey heads just to be able. You know, I don't know about you, but I just cannot see myself 
purchasing dove's dung or donkey heads to get by. But honey, you might think you would never do a lot of things until you got nothing to eat. Can you say that? I still have to wonder. I'll be honest with you. But they were going through a tremendous time in their life. But as soon as the man of God, Elijah, pronounced this curse upon the land of three and a half years upon the people that there would be no rain upon the land. God always has a way of protecting and giving protection and provision and God's guidance and God deals with the man of God. He says, I want you to go over to the brook chair. He says, over there, I'm going to take care of you. Some of you remember the brook chair. So God sends a man of God down to the brook. He says, I want you to hide yourself. You see, God knew that if anybody could find out where the man of God was, they would come hunting him down to find out how to reverse this curse upon the Lamb. So the man of God is hid out. He's living beside a brook, there brook Cherith. The Bible tells us that God not only allowed that brook to provide the water that he needed for himself to sustain him from day to day, but the Bible said that God sent ravens who would bring the meat, the bread, and the flesh that God, God's man would need. The meat comes along, and God uses ravens to bring the man of God something out of nowhere. I don't know about you tonight, but I'm glad that I serve a God that knows how to bless us out of absolutely nowhere. I've had times that I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from. I didn't know where the money was going to come from. But somehow, my God came through. Anybody ever had a miracle check in the mail? Those times of your life where that you obeyed God and you may have gave the last $25 that you have to that visiting family that came and you saw it, you felt God deal with you and you're wondering how am I going to have gas to get to work? Then you get home and the next day you find out that your insurance company and they never do this uh, all of a sudden they find out that you paid to anybody ever had this happen you paid too much money and they sent it back you've ever had that happen raise your hand that sort of thing I've had it happen to me and you think how in the world did this happen I remember several years ago me and my family were going through a very difficult financial time we were living in Okoy on Mack Street and I remember my wife and I trying to figure out how are we going to pay for our next meal? And I remember one day we came home and there was $25 laying right there, on, right in front of our, our doorstep, 20 and a 5, laying right there. And if I'm not mistaken, it was my daughter that found it and she picked it up and said, Mommy, look. And at first we thought, you know, anybody remember that time frame when people were giving those little tracks that looked like money and you picked it up and you wanted to just knock them out in the head? Come on now. You know, I'm being funny, you understand? You know, you picked it up and you thought for sure you just found a hundred dollar bill and it was a track. Anybody remember that? Praise God. We didn't know what it was, but my daughter picked it up, my wife looked at it, and the first thing that came to our mind is somebody from our church or somebody that knew us real well. Well, at that time, we didn't have a really large uh, friend circle, you know. We had a few people that knew us, uh, but we didn't tell anybody. You hear me? I said, we didn't tell anybody that we were in need. We didn't tell our pastor. We didn't tell those around us. We didn't tell anybody that we were in need. But there was $25, Sister Rhonda. We're wondering where did it come from? And so we got on the telephone. We called everybody we knew that would have left $25. We called everybody that would have known, even shred, maybe a thought that they might have known. Every single person, many of them said, I wish I would have known because I'd have left you $25 but I can't take credit for it. To this day, I got no idea where the $25 came from. But I believe this. My God can make $25 come out of absolutely nowhere. Amen. I'm not saying that money grows on trees. Say amen. But I know this. Like one old fashioned preacher said, if you serve God and you're faithful to Him, if the world ain't got but one biscuit left, I believe God's people are going to get it. Why do you believe that? Because he said in the word of God, he said that he takes care of his children. Say amen. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor God see begging bread. That tells me my God knows what I'm going through. He sees my, my heart. He knows my life. He knows what I have need. Say amen, somebody. Give the Lord praise tonight. But the man of God, Elijah, 
Elisha is there at the brook Cherith. I want you to get a little picture here tonight from the Word. Here's a man of God, a great prophet of the day. He's living off the brook. And each day, as this famine progresses, you might imagine in your mind, anybody ever been up near the mountains? Uh, and you see, when the water comes off the mountains, we used to live in a house that there was a creek by the air that ran behind. And when the water, the ice would melt off the mountain, it would go down into that creek. And, and there were certain seasons that that water would be real high. Other times, there'd be just a little narrow creek, water running through it. Can you imagine in your mind, Brother Eric, when you look and you think about it, here's a man that's living during a time of drought, and God sends him to the brook Cherith, and as time goes by, that stream that used to be maybe four, maybe ten or twelve foot wide, he begins to watch it as it goes down, 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 down. How he knows uh, that sometimes in our lives, when we see things that don't look right, when things look like they're going backwards instead of forwards, uh, it plays on your mind. And I don't care if you're the most faith-filled, uh, spirit-filled, sanctified, Holy Ghost baptized child of God. There are times uh, that we let our flesh get a hold of us uh, and we say, oh, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if I'm going to die right here. I wonder what's going to happen. But he didn't leave the brook Cherith uh, until God said, get up, son, and go to Zarephath. Uh, there's something to be said about that tonight. Uh, you might be in a place of your life uh, and you say, I'm ready to jump ship, Pastor. I, I'm ready to leave. Uh, I'm ready to quit. Uh, but before you go anywhere here, Brother Wise, uh, you better stick your feet in the sand uh, and bury yourself down. Say, I'm anchored in the rock tonight. Uh, I'm staying right here. God didn't give me fresh orders uh, and I ain't doing anything till God says to do it. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Yeah. Come on, Pastor. The man of God watched that brook when it got down to nothing. And Sister Miranda, the day that God seen that the brook dried up, he said to Elijah, he said, I want you to get up. Go over to Zarephath. So Elijah gets up. He heads over to Zarephath. When he gets to the edge of the king of the city, Brother David, he encounters a woman Here's a little widow woman. Historians and others that I've read behind over the years, they have said it in, in, in I guess you would kind of look at it like, here was a woman by all accounts uh, that it was very possible that before her husband died, uh, he was a man of God. And God already knew about this woman and her heritage because her husband was a man of God. Now, I don't know that, but that's what I have read. So here's a woman, uh, and Brother Stephen, she's out in the yard, or out in the front there, and she's going around, she's looking uh, for firewood uh, to build her last fire before that she dies. Uh, anybody see that in your mind tonight? And while she's out there gathering up sticks, uh, upon comes the man of God. He sees her near the gate of the city, and he looks to her, and he says, what have you got in the house? And she tells him, all I've got in this house It's a cruise of oil and a little bit of meal in a barrel. And so the man of God, he tells her, he says, what I want you to do, I need you to bring me a drink. So the woman of God, she turns. She's out there gathering sticks. She turns and she heads back towards her house. But as she turns to go back to the house, the man of God said, no, 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 no wait, wait just a minute. I want you to also bring me something to eat. The woman turns around and I want you to hear what she tells the man of God. She says in verse 12, and as the Lord thy God liveth, she said, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel. Anybody got that? A handful of... How many of you bakers, how many women cook anything? Raise your hand. This is about to get real. Praise God. Hallelujah. How many of you bake? You cook. How many of you ladies can look at me and say you can't do very much with a handful of flour, a handful of meal? What kind of biscuits you going to make with a little handful of... Anybody understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. That woman understands her dilemma. And I want you to hear her words. She said, as the Lord God God did them, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, a little oil in a cruise. And she said, behold, she said, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for my son that we may eat it and die. Everyone got that? This woman is prepared to die. She's prepared for the worst. She's already in her mind. Uh, it's the 
again. This is it. I've lived three and a half years during this drought. It's turned into a new famine. We don't have much in the house. I've looked around about. All I've got is a little dinky handful of meal. And all I've got is a little bit of oil and a cruise. Somebody say, help us right here, God. You see, when I looked at this, that barrel is just a little handful. And the bottle is just a little. But what some of you may not understand, that word that we look at in the Hebrew for that barrel, it is the word tad. That simply means it's a deep, earthen-like vessel that through translation over the years has also been deemed as a barrel. Now we're not talking about a barrel that looks like a whiskey barrel with wood and metal slats. But it is a deep earthen vessel. Can I tell somebody? I'm going to show you something right here. I tell you, when I used to evangelize, one of the hardest things to do is to go to a church that will send about 500 people and have 20 people in the house and preach to that. Man, you talk about feeling weird. Now you can go to a church that will send 50 and you got 20 and it don't feel weird. Come on now. You know the reason is it's because there's so much volume that it makes everything else look small. When you know that it's from the original translation that that vessel, it was a deep vessel. Here you've got a deep vessel and there ain't much in it. Anybody feel what I'm saying? Even normally, I had to wonder in my mind tonight how many times, Brother Stephen, that that earthen vessel was filled to the top. She knows what it feels like to have a supper to eat off of. But when she goes this time, all she sees is a little bit in the bottom of a deep vessel. Amen. Help us hear Holy Ghost tonight. You see, the original word for little. Some of you are like, really? You're going to break down the word little? Yeah. Come on, come on. The original translation in the Hebrew for the word little, when it talked about a little oil in a cruise, it is mayot, which means a very small amount. Brother Myers, I probably could have got that. Well, the Lord led me in this direction because He wanted me to remind you, and me, and anybody listening online, that it wasn't just a little bit. It was a very small amount in the bottom of the bottle. That cruise is a bottle-like vessel. So we got Brother Farmer a bottle, and we got a barrel. And the, the bottle has got a very small amount. And the barrel, the barrel's got a small amount of a handful, and the bottle's got just a very small amount in it. Either way you look at it, they both don't have very much. Somebody listen to me right here. What we in American society would deem that quantity inside of those vessels would be one word, insufficient. Somebody say that with me tonight, insufficient. Oh, I'm going to preach with the Lord's help tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost. But it was insufficient. In other words, it ain't enough. Has anybody ever felt like you just didn't have enough? Say man, somebody. You see, as you and I look around the world today, there's one fact that I know, that we are living in a society that our moral compass is about bankrupt. It seems as though that everything is right or wrong. The world now says it's right. We see so much evil and ungodliness on every hand. We are in a generation where they think nothing of murdering thousands of babies every year in the name of pro-choice. You call it what you want to. I'm not here to advocate politics. But I will tell you this. We've got to the day when the moral compass is so far out of whack. And here's what God has shown us. You see, we live in a generation just like they did. You see, they had a natural drought. They had a natural famine. They had a natural time of insufficiency. Don't you listen to me here. They lived in a time of tremendous great need. Homes did not know where their next meal was coming from. Mamas who were taking from their own self, not eating. So their children could eat. Is anybody here who wants to say? 
Would anybody agree with me tonight and say, Pastor, you can move on. We believe they lived in a time of incredible need. Hello, Uncle Sean. I'll tell you something, Mike. You and I may not understand this, but we live in a time of incredible need. Look around the world that we live in today. Our prisons, they're building more of them. Prisons are full of those that need deliverance. There are meth addicts who started off with a prescription and they got addicted to a prescription and now they're walking the streets. We've got young girls that were raised in good families. Mamas and daddies that loved them. But some friends said, hey, try this. And today, a beautiful young girl is walking up and down the streets of our cities. But you can't recognize her. You know the reason why you can't recognize her is because sin has got a hold I said sin has got a hold of her. We've got young women who are selling their bodies to pay for the next high. You've got men that are taking advantage of women. We've got sex traffic rings. We've got everything you can imagine in the day that we're living in. We've got people in need of deliverance. We've got souls in need of salvation. There are homes that are in trouble tonight. There are marriages on the verge of divorce. There are churches on the verge of closing. Somebody say we're in a time of great need. Help me, Holy Ghost. I don't know if you understand tonight, but we too, in the year 2017, we too have a barrel and a bottle yes. and sometimes barely enough. Yes. What, what are you saying, Brother Myers? I'm just going to be real with you. The truth is that I don't know anybody that's got the right mind in God that ain't never felt like that they were insufficient in some way. Is there anybody that teaches or ever taught? Raise your hand. Leave it up for a minute. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever gone to the classroom and felt insufficient? Have you ever gone to the classroom and felt ill prepared even though you stayed up all night, night last night? Have you ever any singers in the house that you got up and sang and you looked around the house and you thought maybe somebody else could sing this better than me? You, you felt ill prepared. You felt insufficient. You might have feel what I'm saying. Let me tell you this. You might be the next preacher, preacher's wife. You might be the next missionary. But I can tell you this. Every one of us, if we got a right mind in God, have had times that we didn't feel sufficient. We didn't feel as good as somebody else. We didn't feel like we could do it like somebody else did it. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter if you got a barrel full or you got a bottle full. You may come on somebody. If you're willing to pour out what God Sometimes wish somebody else was preaching this so I could just run a little while. Come on, Come on, I'm being serious. Amen. I want you to get a hold of this. I'm going to slow down long enough for you to hear this very clearly. So, you have a bottle, you have a barrel, and you don't have very much in it, very little. Other people look, other people could look in there and say, yep, you don't have very much. They may listen to you online and sing, sit back and go, well, she ain't got very much. They may hear Pastor Myers preach and say, mm, he ain't got very much. But I'm not, I'm not concerned myself with those who are hating on that. Because here is what I want you to understand. You may not have but a handful, a little dinky handful. You might have very little in the bottle. Well, as long as you are willing that whenever it comes time to do what the man of God told you, and in this case, when God says, hey, you, get in that classroom and teach. Hey, you, get up there and sing. Hey, you, get a mission work going. Hey, you, start up a nursing home ministry. Hey, you knock on doors in the church. Hey, you, when God says to do it, here's the fact in the bottom line of it. When you decide to do what that little woman did, that little widow woman, 
is used to before her husband died doing what most of the women did and depending on a husband to do it for her. Make a living. This time, she can't send her husband out to buy or to get sticks. She's got to depend on herself. Now, I'll tell you this. I've been in churches where that only a select few people are going to pray for you. Only a select few people are can do any little thing in the church as far as being a big shot. You understand what I'm saying? Well, the only way you're going to get healed is if you let brother so-and-so pray for you. Is he not hear what I'm saying? When you stop and you get to the place when it's just you, you can't depend on those that raised you. You can't depend on those you used to go to church with. You can't depend on those who you got confidence in. You might be in a hospital room somewhere laying beside a dead employee, a dying employee or an employer or some friend of yours and your pastor ain't there. Your whole home crew ain't there. Those you used to run with ain't there. Honey, I still believe that you can do like the widow woman and pour out. You say, God, I've had people tell me before they said, Brother Myers, I don't really know how to pray good. Now, I want you to be honest with me. Has anybody ever started praying? And in the midst of praying, the words got jumbled up and you said something that didn't even make sense. Come on, sir. We all have Huh? God, flip this heel. Huh? And you're like, Trying to keep on praying like nobody heard you. God foot this heel. Huh? Boy, things when you mess up make you feel so small. You feel so insufficient. But I found out. You ain't got to be the cat lady speaker. Come on now. You ain't got to have a CD with your name on the top. And in every household in America. All you got to do is when God says, hey, do thus and so. You're like, okay, God, this is all I've got. i got a little handful of talent. i got a little pinch of this and a little pinch of that. God says, hey, pull out what you do have. And when you look again tomorrow, there's going to be more in the barrel. You see, tonight, you are that.
you got a picture of me. His big toe in the whole world would be saved when the right hand over it that way. Huh? When you say you got a pinch of something, you realize you don't got a pinch of your own self. Now, some people might, but I'm talking about people that are trying to serve the Lord. You say, Well, I ain't got but a pinch, I got but a handful. Or, like the old Hebrew translation, cat, which simply means a hey, barrel. I've only got a little bit of handful in my cat, in my barrel. Let me tell somebody what you don't understand is that little handful sufficient. Come on. I'm going to preach to somebody right here. And I hope you're listening to me. Come on, on my God bless you. Well, whenever I can pray like brother so and so, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do God's will. When I can get up and sing like her, I'm going to do God's will. Am I the only one that sees a problem with that? I'm not talking about preparation. I'm not talking about studying to show yourself approved before you launch out and get yourself attacked by devils. What I'm talking about is somebody who has stacked up excuses miles and miles and miles and miles. I can't because. I won't because. I would but. Am I preaching tonight? Come on, come on, I'm still preaching tonight on a barrel, a bottle, and barely enough. You know what God showed us through the Word of God, Brother Eric? He showed us right here. And then right at the very tail end of this story, when that widow woman decided that that little bit of was what maybe all she had, she was going to make it for herself, she went against the grain. She did not do what self would have wanted to do. I want you to listen to this part right here. Anybody tuned in? She could have very easily said no. That's all I got left. That ain't, that's all I got left. Now, Prophet Elijah, if I had a little bit more, I got a son in there that's laying dying. I hope y'all didn't miss that part. How many of your mamas don't want to see your babies die? Or your grandchildren die? Anybody? What if Brother Myers walked up to you during the famine and I looked at you, Sister Ron, and I said, don't feed your baby. Don't feed yourself. The last meal you got. Give it to me. God told me to tell you that. That'd be hard to do. As much as you love Brother Myers, you might as well admit it. She denied self. Somebody hear what I'm saying. She denied self and put the will of God first. Can I tell somebody, when you deny self and put the will of God first, you're going to reach down to that meal barrel. You may say, I don't see much. I don't look at much. It don't feel like much. But when you go back the next day, here's a little bit more. Then you go back the next day, and it's a little bit more. Does anybody else feel what I'm saying? I'll tell you this morning. You know, I remember some years ago, I got so many other things I could preach tonight, but I've already made my point, and I don't want to preach you to death of me. Brother Stephen, down there in that camp, was it Lake Placid that they used to have where Brother Teague was pastoring that? Next, not far from Cluiston? Lake Placid. I couldn't remember the name early, and I was trying to remember it. I want to tell you a little something. I'm going to show you. Back when the Sister Myers and I were evangelizing, we had a van, had a lot of problems. The air conditioning didn't work. Sometimes we would drive to uh, preach revivals with the windows down. And you know my wife, she got long hair. And before she had a thyroid issue, her hair used to be all the way back down to like right here. And we would roll those windows down and, she, and we'd have sweat all around our necks and all that kind of stuff. We never thought too much of it. We just made it happen. I reached in and pulled my, my babies out, Miranda, Devin, Justin, out of that back seat before, and their whole back be soaking wet with sweat. And I would feel bad about it, but we did what we did for the will of God. And I remember this one particular time that God reminded me of today. Some of you may have heard me tell this, some maybe not. 
But we were in Lake Placid, Florida. And I think Lake Placid is about, it's at least an hour and a half, I think, or something like that. I know it's, it's a good ways off. It's been so long since I've drove that path. I don't remember, but it is a long ways away. Could be two and a half, could be an hour and a half. I think it's uh, two and a half hours or so, three, almost three hours or so from Lake Placid down to Clewiston, Florida. Well, we were in a camp meeting in Lake Placid, Florida. I want you to hear this. How many loves to hear what God does? Well, I'm about to tell you. We were in a camp meeting. And during that camp meeting, we were right there at the tail end. And uh, they stood up. They said, we're short to be able to make the, uh, the camp meeting, you know, the finances of it. Well, we stood behind the camp meeting and support. And I told my wife, we didn't have, it, I think, $75 left. We put the $75 in. Uh, and then I didn't know it was going to work out like this. But before we left that day, I had a preacher that came to me. And he said, tomorrow morning, which was Sunday. Of what they said, I want you to come to our church and I want you to preach for us. And immediately I thought to myself, well, I hope we got the money to get there. If you've never evangelized, you wouldn't really understand this, but if you ever had, you would. And so the day that we got up, we went out to the van on a Sunday morning. We had about a three-hour drive ahead of us. I got in. There was nothing wrong with the van's electronic system. The gas gauge, all of that stuff worked perfectly. We got in, and I looked down, and I didn't pay it any mind when we drove to the camp meeting because it was at night, and it was late, and we were trying to get there. But this time, I looked down, and the, e, the gauge just passed the E. I looked at my wife and I said, I don't know what we're going to do. I guess I'm going to have to call him and tell him we can't come. I could have just done what self wanted to do. Just call him, maybe ask somebody around there, hey, can you give me a couple bucks? I can just get home. It's a little closer maybe than here. But I sat there. I said, well, let's, let's see how far we go. Flat, buried past the E. You know your vehicle. Anybody understand what I'm saying? That vehicle, if you drove it more than three to five miles past that E mark, ran out of gas. We got in it. We drove. And the whole way to Cluiston, we prayed. And we prayed. We prayed. The entire trip, we prayed. I'm going to tell you something. Anybody feel what I'm saying? When you get about three quarters of the way and you're looking at each other like, my God in heaven. I don't know. It reminds me of the story of a preacher that I know. He was praying for a man that was dying. He had lost his heart rate. He had grabbed a hole in his hand in a hospital room. They said they brought the family in. But the preacher grabbed his hand, began to pray for it. All of a sudden, the heart rate came back on the monitor. And the doctor looked at him and said, Pastor, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing whatever you're doing. Oh, hallelujah. Three quarters of the way. I'm thinking to myself, man, boy, I'm telling you, at least we can get real close. We can at least call the pastor and tell him, come on, get us the rest of the way. So we got real close to close. I'll get nervous. I'm thinking, you know, maybe God at least get us part away. My flesh start, I'm doing like Peter, you know, I'm out there on the water, but I start getting a little nervous, I'll be honest with you. Uh, my wife can be a witness to what I'm about to tell you. We drove what is about whatever three hour drive all the way from Plant City or Lake Placid to Clewiston, Florida. When we pulled up, we were still praying. We pulled up into, there was a dip that went down and then up into a parking space. As we were pulling into that parking space, it said, P -p 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 I preached that morning, didn't have a dollar to my name. They received an offering by the farmer and took up a $500 offering that morning. Let me tell you, you say it ain't very much for the lives in the barrel. I ain't got much in the cruise. I ain't got much in the barrel of a bottle. But honey, when you let God help you, when you obey God and you step out by faith, I said, that's all right. You stepped out by faith. Now, I am going to bless your latter end. 
that afternoon. We was all hot, stinking, sweaty from driving that drive, preaching my guts out that morning, getting up, trying to help God's people. That afternoon, and that clues then was small then, still kind of small now. There wasn't a lot of really fancy hotels around, but there was a newer hotel. You might know what I'm talking about. And the pastor said, I'm going to put you up in a place I know you're going to like. Well, man, when we pulled up, we got out, we went to the hotel. I think that because of the seats, uh, that pastor paid like $150 to put us up in a hotel room. I thought, my God, I felt like I was living like a king. You got to know, folks, uh, we were used to eating Roman noodles. Uh, we were used to making hamburger meat out of everything. Come on now. We would take hamburger meat and make beef for only, and then stewed beef, uh, hamburger helper, mac, uh, come on, hamburger mac, uh, ham, come on now. We'd make it all hamburgers. We put it in. Come on now. We was used to that. Or you take somebody that don't know much about much and they just simple minded love God and got too much money and, uh, and you put them in a $150 a day hotel room. Boy, you feel like kings. All because in a time of great need, somebody didn't put self first. They put the will of God first. And they went in. I want you to see this in your mind tonight. I know that many have preached about this story. I've never heard it preached this way. This is brand new out of the baker's oven. I've never preached this before. But I'm just going to tell you. In my mind, I can see us. We feel like that we don't have very much inside of us to give anybody. A pastor, whenever I've got a lot of singing under my belt, when I've got lots of preaching under my belt, when I've got lots of this and that and the other, then I'll obey God. But I'll tell you, one of the greatest blessings of coming to life is when you might not have as much in the eyes of God to give. I'm going to prove something to you. I want you to think on this. You know I use a lot of examples. Folks, we expect it out of some people. Oh, he's been preaching all of his life. We expect him to get up and preach a good sermon. We expect that. But tell me if I'm wrong or right here. You go to a youth camp or a camp meeting, you take somebody that ain't hardly been preaching very long, still wet behind the ears, so, and they get up and preach a phenomenal message. It just takes us all by surprise. Come on now. And you look around to yourself and you think to yourself, now I expected that out of the camp meeting night speaker. I expected that out of the morning speaker. I expected that out of that pastor that's been pastoring most of his life. But when that young man got up and preached, I remember when Brother McHugh, he's passed away now. i got to close here shortly. But my heart is so full tonight. When Brother McHugh went to a camp meeting, it was Marietta Church of God. I don't remember the year, but I remember that one of the preachers that I liked a lot was preaching in that meeting. We went up to Marietta up there in uh, uh, Marietta Church of God up near Jacksonville area. They had a camp meeting that they did every year, and they treated us real good. And one of the days, uh, the pastor of the womb came, and he asked me if I would preach the sermon on uh, one of the days. Boy, I thought I was, boy, I was so excited. I'm about to preach my first camp meeting. Hallelujah. I thought, boy, that's some good stuff right here. You know what I mean? I got up that morning, I studied, I sought God, I prayed, Brother Eric, boy, I really dug in. I got up and I preached. I still remember the message I preached. I preached on the spider's web. After that service was over, Brother McHugh had a very strange way about him. He was very unique, but he was a great man. He came around to me and he said, hey, boy, what you going to be doing? So and so, we named off some date. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, man, I better know what I'm doing tomorrow. I'm trying to act like I got my calendar together. I said, I don't know. I said, I'll probably can look at it and see. <laughs> I'm just being truthful with that. So, yeah, it was all of them. Yeah. Wasn't no other revivals. Matter of fact, I never preached one. So he said, boy, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I was watching you up there preaching this morning. He said, now don't go get the big head on me. He said, but son, he said, you got the stuff. Amen. Amen. Every once in a while, it does us good when we feel like we ain't got much in the barrel for somebody to come along and say, you got it. 
Because you look in the mirror and you don't feel like much, but somebody come along and say, I can see it. I can feel it. I'm going to tell you something. It made me feel so much better. I went and preached my very first revival. I told you the man like I had a heart attack the night he was chasing me around the church, beating me with his coat jacket, and the next morning we was at the hospital. Serious. But I'm going to tell you something. I look back on that and I'll never forget those days, but I'm going to tell you, that has helped me to get to where I am tonight. And as you stand all across the house, I'm going to remind some of you, you may feel like the least among us. You may feel like you ain't got much to offer. But I want you to understand here tonight, if you will just pour out, God said, honey, when you go back in the morning, I'm going to take care of you. You might not see very much. You might not be able to have enough money to buy you a Coca-Cola tomorrow. But I'm going to make sure you got what you need. Somebody say, thank God. You might say, I'm never going to cut my own CD. But that's all right, God. If every time I get up and sing, I keep pouring out and you keep pouring out. Sister Miranda, come and play us something here this evening. As Miranda comes around, I know this is Thursday night, but as far as I'm concerned, I would preach to you just like somebody invited me to preach a revival in the middle of nowhere to a thousand people. I preach the same way. But I'm going to tell you folks something tonight. We need uh, to understand you're not a nobody. Come on. Right. Come here, Sister Linda. Hey, I'm going to pick on you tonight. Okay? I'm going to pick on you real bad. I'm going to make you turn red and everything. No, I'm kidding. I don't do that. In the last couple of weeks, I'm so proud of Sister Linda. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm proud of all of you, and I don't want anybody to leave here. You didn't say nothing about me. You might be next. Huh? But in the last couple of weeks, and different things, God's been talking to you, helping you. She called me. I'm talking to my wife. She said, the Lord so me you're going to get that job. Well, if you didn't understand the situation, my wife went through so many different letdowns with this and that and the other and all these loopholes and everything kept falling through. She said, I, I just feel like God showed me. Some of you know about the situation with my cousin Amanda and they told her that she had this life-threatening disease. Two different things, two different test results, two different doctors. But Sister Linda said, no, God show me, you ain't got that. Now, I'm not telling you that there might come a time the devil fights your mind, but I'm going to tell you something, don't it feel good? Don't it boost your faith? Whenever you obey God and you think in the back of your mind, well, what if I say that and it don't, did that ever go for you? What if I tell them that and it don't happen? It, I'm making it real. This is real stuff, folks. You can preach a lot of things, but this is a real deal. But the good thing is, because when you're like that widow woman, Brother Ralph, you go in there and you mope around the kitchen and you think to yourself, well, this is my last meal, but God, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to do what you said. I'll call up Sister so and so and I'll tell them what you're talking about. Oh, I sure hope this goes good. And you do it. And then when you get the phone call or the text message and they say, I just got the last results back and they just told me that they cleared me and I don't have it. All of a sudden, it's like the first day that that woman knew the day before she had emptied the complete contents of the bottle, the complete contents of the cruise and the barrel. And the next day that that woman walked in there and she looked down inside that deep reservoir and there was a little bit more. I don't know about you, but there's some things in this life that make me feel like just shouting the victory. I'll tell you this much. You may have fallen out of hell and the devil may have said you'll never amount to anything because you messed up. But as I close tonight, I want to remind you, if you're a backslider, you can get in the altar easily and you can easily say, tonight, I'm going to step over my past and I'm stepping into the will of God tonight. As every head is bowed, every eye is closed tonight. I'm stepping into the will of God tonight and I'm leaving the old me behind. You might be here tonight and say, Pastor, I've never known any of what you're talking about. I've never felt this. I've never heard this before. And I still don't understand it, Pastor. But I know this much. I feel something in this service. And whatever that is, I'll tell you what it is. It's the power of God 
And you say tonight, Pastor, I want the Lord to take me by the hand and save me. If that's you, I want you to find yourself to the altar tonight. Let God, let God, I said let God heal your spirit. You may be here tonight and say, Pastor Myers, I've got some hurt. I need God to heal me. If that's you, friend, I get down on my face and I say, God, I'm feeling insufficient. I'm going to be honest with you, God. I don't feel like much. I may feel like at times I'm a nobody. But tonight, even if there ain't much in that bed, I'm going to pour out what little bit I got. And I'm going to do it for the glory of God. My friend, I'm going to trust God with you. And you are going to go back tomorrow. You're going to go back the day after. And whether the barrel is full or whether that bottle is full or whether there's barely anything in the bottom of it, I am believing God with you to keep you in the fight for the Lord tonight. God, I'm asking you tonight, God, to touch my son of all. God, that you'll touch his spirit in his mind and his heart, God, for the glory of the Lord. We need you, Lord. If there's ever been a time in our life, God, we want to keep growing. We're not going to let the devil have his way. We're going to throw our stuff at the mercy of God. We're going to say, God, use us. Talk to us. Help us, Lord, by your perfect will. Touch our friends here this evening, Lord. I pray, God, let them feel your strength tonight. God, there's so many battles that we fight. I pray, touch this dear lady to this evening. God, let her feel your help. I only know one that can help us like you can and that's you. Others may try to encourage us. But there are things, God, you can do for us in this altar tonight, God, that nobody else can do. There are things that you can do inside of us that nobody else can do. Things you can tell us that nobody else can tell us. God, we're ready to do the will of God. Whatever you say, whenever, however, I don't want to get ahead of you. But I sure don't want to lag behind you, God. God, tonight I put myself at the mercy.